we're doing comedy at a church. Like, like how's this gonna work out, really? I mean, some people are like, I just came to see this thing explode. <laughs> What's so amazing about doing comedy at church, when I was a kid, laughing at church was illegal. We couldn't laugh at church. I remember one time laughing at church because this lady was jumping around and her wig fell off. So, <laughs> that stuff was funny. Her wig fell off and then my I laughed. My grandmother would pinch and twist. I can understand a pinch. You gonna twist? That's the devil. <laughs> Dude on stage is mad at everybody. I can't figure out why he's so angry. Seven years old, I figured out why he was so angry. He was angry because he had some phlegm caught in his throat. So at the end of every sentence, he'd try to get it out. He'd be like, the Lord said, ha! Act like you're ha! I'm like, Grandma, he need to gargle, Grandma. <laughs> I'm seven years old, man. Church lasts six hours, too. <laughs> then we go in the basement to eat a sandwich and come back up. I'm like, what was that, halftime or something? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to be real with you. There's enough black people here. It was always chicken. Why we always got to eat chicken <laughs> every single time? I know. I, I had to tell them. I'm sorry. It was, we had church, you know? and tuna. <laughs> At the end of church, they would ask us, I was like, so you want to go? After this, we all going to go to the sister church. I don't even like the brother church. <laughs> One time I get to church, seven years old, there's a dead body in the front. It's a funeral. Nobody explains that to a seven-year-old Michael Jr. I'm thinking that's how they roll. Like every three weeks or so, they bring a dead body in <laughs> as an example or something. <laughs> and the dude on stage yell at everybody in the audience like they the ones that did it. <laughs> I remember asking my grandmother, I'm looking for some explanation. I'm like, Grandma, what happened to the man in the box? What happened to the man in the box? Her whole explanation was, he in a better place. <laughs> I'm like, what kind of box did he live in before? Dude on stage said he went to see the king. That was his whole explanation. He went to see the king. Ha! <laughs> I don't understand what that meant. They didn't even call the kids' choir to sing. I was in the kids' choir, not because I wanted to be in the kids' choir. I was in the kids' choir because I was a kid. <laughs> and it was a requirement. And what song we got to sing? Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. I don't want to see the king. I don't want to see the king. You ever go to a funeral and people always talking about the person in the box like they sure he going to heaven? <laughs> and then they tell you, that they, and then the people get up there, they always talking about him. And the last thing you know, like the dude stabbed three people and he never prayed one time in his life. And all of a sudden, everybody, like, he going to heaven. He's like, I'm sure Uncle John is looking down at me right now, and he's a little tear is going down his eye. I'm like, he's probably looking up at you right now. <laughs> that's, a, that's a sweat bead is what it is, a sweat bead rolling over. I just made that up right now. I just made that up. Well, good morning, and... Welcome to Open Arms Community Church as we worship online together. Uh, that brings back some memories for me. Uh, I remember the uh, pinch and the twist during worship when I was a kid. The pinch and the twist. Somehow, uh, my father in particular seemed to have the reach. No matter how long the pew was and how far away we were, he seemed to be able to have, like, stretch Armstrong arms to reach over and give the pinch and the twist, and then the look, too. So, but we're glad that you're worshiping with us today. And uh, 
It's not too late to invite family and friends to tune in this morning on uh, YouTube or the Facebook Live, and we encourage you to do that. A few announcements. Uh, first, I want to thank you again for your continued generosity through the U.S. Postal Service or with GiveLify and your ongoing gifts to support the ministry, uh, Jesus ministry through Open Arms Community Church. We're th thankful for that. Uh, we continue to receive donations as well towards uh, possibly upgrading the new sign that we're going to put out front to an LED sign. If you have questions about that, contact me and I can give you a little more information. Uh, we need your prayers as well. Met yesterday with the lead team and we are working on a plan to have us regather together in the worship center here. And we need your prayers. We need you to uh, support and share ideas and so on and so forth. So uh, I ask you especially to pray. We need that more than, than anything else. Each week, the notes for today's, the day's message are on Facebook and YouTube. They're linked there, and I invite you to grab hold of those. You also see a new thing if you look at YouTube and Facebook. Uh, Jay worked on a digital connection card for us. And uh, you can see the link that's right there. Just click on it. It'll give you a digital connection card, place where you can put your name and uh, prayer requests or suggestions, uh, next steps that we're going to talk about later on in worship. It's right there. And then you make the choice. When you click to submit it, I will be the only one that will receive those connection cards. No one else will see them. If you decide you want me to share your prayer requests and next steps with our prayer team on that digital connection card, you're able to make that choice. And then I will only share with the prayer team those of you and your requests that indicate you want me to do that. But uh, something new, let's try it out and, and see how this goes as we continue to support one another. Also, be on the lookout for a very important survey that will be coming your way. Uh, it'll be announced and links for it on Facebook and YouTube. There will also be an emergency text or phone call that will go out to people to let them know, let you know that the survey is there. It has to do with reopening. We need your uh, uh, ideas, encouragement, and so forth. If you're not signed up already to the text and phone line, I encourage you to do that. It's easy enough to do. Uh, if you have questions about how to do that, you can contact me or you can contact Jay and we'll get back to you and uh, make sure that you can sign up. Uh, I looked quickly yesterday and I think I counted 37 or 38 families associated with our congregation who are not yet signed up for the emergency text or phone. It's the easiest way to keep up to date on everything that's going on. So I encourage you to sign up if you would please. All right, enough with the announcements. Let's spend some time in prayer, please. In the midst of the craziness and noise of our world, O oh Lord, we need these quiet moments in your presence. We need you, Lord, by your Holy Spirit to kind of help us take a deep breath, exhale, and kind of relax as we spend these special moments together with you. We're not going to forget about the stresses and strains of our life. But I ask, Lord, that if possible, would you, in these moments where we worship you, in, would you please kind of turn down the intensity of those things that are bothering us, the real needs that we have in our lives? And would you remind us in a new way, a fresh way, that you are with us, Lord, and that we can count on you even if it seems like we can't count on anything else in our lives. Many of us, Lord, are hurting at this time. 
maybe physical ailments, maybe spiritual, psychological, emotional, and the needs are real, Lord. And we ask for your help. Some of us, Lord, need provision, a new job, a better job, enough resources so that it covers the bills that we have every month. And as you provide for us, Lord, continue to teach us lessons of stewardship, how to manage the resources you place under our control in a godly manner. Lord, some of us are struggling with fractures in relationship, perhaps with persons living under the same roof where we live, or another family member or a friend or something at work. And reconciliation seems to be impossible, Lord, but you are the God who can perform the impossible because all things are possible with you. So if there's a way in which healing can come to some relationships, Lord, open our eyes to see how that could happen. Let us know the steps that we ought to try. But might we do it safely? Lord, you know what's kind of rattling around in our minds right now. The things that we might say we need the most the things that we're looking for from you more than anything else. And I ask, oh, Heavenly Father, that you would graciously hear your people as we pray. And then please take care of us as only you can, as only you will, as we pray in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. standing in line to buy a pair of shoes that came out when I was nine years old. Yeah. Girls are rocking poetic justice braids. Dudes rocking styles that came out before Brenda had a baby. It's a Tupac reference for y'all, I didn't get that. <laughs> Swimsuits, polo boots, skinny ties, retro shoes, jean jackets, snapbacks, bucket hats, afros, somewhere, some stonewashed jeans from Goodwill have found salvation in the closet of a girl who loves trendy fashion. On the sidewalk, there's a boy with a high top fade, two parts on the side. He ain't even old enough to remember cassette tapes or how to rewind them on a Walkman. Yeah. <laughs> Flip it over, press fast forward. So there was a time <laughs> when consciousness loved hip hop. Miss Lauren gave us warnings over old school bass lines like, girls, you know you better. Watch out. Some guys, some guys are only about that thing, that thing, that thing. Yeah, that thing, that thing, that yeah, that was a time. Oldies were just goodies. Retros were not retros. Dudes tucked their new Jordans under platinum FUBU jeans. I hope those never come back. Never. I love vinyl record players that spin us back to a time when two minutes and 42 seconds were all you really needed to tell her how you really feel on a song. Darling, you send me. We love old TV shows that defined our childhood. So watching seasons of Fresh Prince seems like a great investment, maybe because we feel like we're buying back some of the fun we sold to adulthood. We love old couples, because even though it was kind of weird when two old people kissed, the lips that they are tasting spoke vows that stood firm through the years like stone columns in a museum. And their love, their pain have earned every scar, every wrinkle on their skin. We love grandmothers. Because even though her frail hands began to shake, her love always stood steady 
And she would sing songs. She would sing songs you wouldn't understand unless you done been through something. Unless you done seen God make a miracle out of misery. We love the relics, the vintage, the classics, the loyal companions because they remain unfazed by phases. We love them because we trust them. We trust them because we know them. I know this because I know God. See, we love the old because they've proven themselves. We admire how they found a way to protest against time itself. When the tidal waves of years came crashing in, beating against their doors, they did not fade back. Just like the God who made them, when the test of times, winds of trends, seasons of society desired to wash them out, they rebelled by simply remaining the same. And even when their voices seemed unheard, they were always there. They were always there. Unlike God, sometimes people change. People change and so do their ideas. But as if I'm still behind the times, people still ask me why I still love God. I tell them something that is timeless can never become outdated. It's wonderful to know that God's love for us in Christ Jesus uh, is always fresh and new. We can count on him no matter what. If you haven't already, I invite you to click on the link for the message notes, the fill in the blanks that are there on uh, YouTube and Facebook. And while you're doing that, click on the link for the digital connection card and keep in mind the next steps God might want you to have and take in your spiritual journey as we continue. We're going to continue our study of Jesus Beatitudes. We're going to talk today about necessary neediness. Necessary neediness. In a sense, the Beatitudes make the declaration that we want to be like Jesus in every aspect of our lives. We want to develop his character, his conduct, and how we live our lives moment by moment and day by day. But it starts with necessary neediness. I mentioned last week as we began looking at the Beatitudes that the Beatitudes are assur assertions of Jesus' approval. The blessedness that Jesus offers is a result of living under his gracious authority right here and right now. Not waiting until sometime, you know, when we go to heaven. But right here and right now is heaven is kind of broken into our lives, into our worlds because Jesus is with us by his spirit. Jesus approves of us as we are obeying him, as we allow Christ to shape our daily lives. I know when Jesus walked the dusty roads of Palestine 20-some centuries ago, life was so different than what we have now, but was it really that much different? We read history and we see Persons way back when struggling with some of the same heart issues that we struggle with. We just have more technology, more ways of choosing to re remove ourselves from the presence of the God who loves us. But we need to allow Christ to shape our daily lives without a doubt. I want you to remember as we look at this study of the Beatitudes that blessed are those who are journeying with Jesus. Blessed are those who are journeying with Jesus. Now, I keep saying this next statement over and over and over again, but I repeat it because it's uh, crucial to our understanding of journeying with Jesus. His teachings are intended to transform us, not merely to inform us. Each one of us, my friends, needs to be changed from the inside out. We need God's grace to develop attitudes and actions and even reactions that show that we belong to Jesus, that we are Christ followers, that we are Christians, and that indeed, as each day passes, we are becoming more and more like him. That's what it's all about. Now, the first beatitude is in Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. And if you look what you've downloaded, you see the page numbers there. They correspond to the Bibles that we use here. I make the offer week after week. If you need a Bible, want a Bible, and you want a Bible safely delivered to your home, kind of left on the porch or your side door or whatever it is, just let me know, and we'll make sure that we get a Bible to you. 
But the first beatitude is this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We're going to look more directly at what it means to be poor in spirit in a moment. But I want to reiterate for us today that being blessed, experiencing Jesus' forgiving love, starts with a certain way of thinking about God and about ourselves. If you tuned in last week, you recall the parable that Jesus told about the religious leader and the hated tax man. You remember from last week that we talked about the fact that the Pharisee, the religious leader, prayed about himself and was thankful that he was better than other people, especially the tax man that was there. In contrast, Jesus in his story tells us that the tax man only prayed these words, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That contrast and that parable there wonderfully illustrates what it means to be poor in spirit. See, when we're standing in the presence of Almighty God, and indeed, God's presence is, we are living in God's present moment by moment and day by day. It doesn't take being in the worship center. It takes just living life. And it makes sense if we are reminded that we are in God's presence, that the best thing that we can request is for God's undeserved kindness. I mean, really, if we stop and think about it, what do we have to offer the Lord of all things? The one who spoke the word and vast universes came into existence. What do we have whereby we could stand in his presence and say, this is why you should love me. This is why you should bless me. This is why I'm better than that guy over there. It makes sense to kind of throw ourselves on the mercy of the God who made us, who loves us, and gave himself for us. Maybe the question we need to ask ourselves as we're discerning what poor in spirit means is how do I view myself and the way I'm living? Because how we view ourselves and when as we took it, take a look at how we're living, why we do the things we do, what's the manner of our living, it starts to answer that question, how we view the Lord God, how we view ourselves, how we view other people. Are we going to find out that we're poor in spirit or find out that we're like the religious person who was patting himself on the back because he was such a great guy. Now, as we look at this first beatitude, I just want to lay it out there that Jesus is not blessing financial poverty. He's not saying that if you lack the resources to care for uh, ourselves and our families, that that's a great thing. No, that's not what he's talking about at all. Now, we know in our day and age and through the centuries, there have been some Christ followers who have taken a vow of poverty and some who have committed themselves to a life of simplicity. In fact, that was part of the history of the Free Methodist Church, of which Open Arms is a part. There used to be a time in the history of our church where it was thought that wearing rings was called superfluous adornment, unnecessary, so you don't wear them, even a wedding band. I'm glad I'm a pastor in the Free Methodist Church in today's world rather than a few, many decades ago. Jesus isn't blessing financial poverty, but we need to remind ourselves that the, the blessings God has given to us, we need to kind of hang on to them loosely, not too tightly. I'll admit I struggle with that in some ways. I want to hang on to, I ask my family, they'll tell you, I'm on the borderline of being a hoarder. 
And some would say, I'm way over the line when it comes to being a hoarder. We need to hang on to things loosely as Jesus blesses us and cares for us. But we need to recognize the fact of this next truth that I'm going to read from Luke chapter 18, verses 24 and 25. Jesus said, How hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. Anybody, including me, kind of picture that? A needle where I, I don't use needles very often, okay? Don't know what to do with them once I put a thread through them. But I do know there's been those times where it's hard to put the thread through. Did anybody here imagine a camel trying to go through the little, uh, eh? It seems impossible. Why? Because for those of us blessed with, with many resources, it is so easy to trust in the stuff of life and kind of crowd Christ out of our lives. To think that the stuff that we have is what saves us. That the stuff that we have is ultimately most important, and it's not. Now, how can a rich person, and in the comparison with a lot of the world in which we live today, it seems like even the poorest of persons in, in our society are richer, have resources that poor in other places in our world could only dream about and hope for. But with God, all things are possible. He can change the hearts of poor persons financially and rich persons financially and everyone in between. In fact, it takes the act of God to make us to be who he wants us to be, to forgive us and bring us back within his presence because of Christ Jesus. Because we can let the stuff of life crowd Jesus out of our lives, even if we don't have a lot of stuff. Because it's how we think and how we feel about the blessings God has given to us. Enough on that. Being poor in spirit is at least three things. First, being poor in spirit is admitting our moral and spiritual defect. That there is something wrong with us. And indeed, with this defect, with this sickness, we cannot help ourselves. And what is this moral and spiritual defect? Summed up in places like Romans chapter 3, verse 23. We are all sinners in need of a Savior. And we as mere mortals cannot save ourselves. As we stand in the presence of God, we are all destitute before him. Friends, we are all in the same sinking ship when it comes to moral and spiritual things. Only the detail of our sin varies about how we've pushed Jesus away from us, how we have tried to be our own God, how we have made up our own rules of what's right and wrong. We are certainly like the sinful tax man from Jesus' parable where what we need is God's mercy. And that's it. We need God's mercy. We don't have the luxury, so to speak, to pat ourselves on the back and say, yeah, you need to really take care of me because that's not the way it is because of our moral and spiritual defect. Being poor in spirit, secondly, is admitting that we have nothing to offer God but who we are right now. I asked a question earlier. What really do we have to offer to the Lord of all things? The answer is nothing. Nothing. What God wants is for us to stand in his presence, knowing that he is with us moment by moment and day by day, to recognize we are in his presence and cry out for his mercy, 
just the way we are. Nowhere in God's Bible are we instructed to kind of clean ourselves up morally and spiritually to make ourselves more acceptable to God. God loves us because of Christ Jesus, exactly who we are right now. And the good news of the gospel of Christ is that Jesus will not leave us the way that he finds us right now, but he will begin a process of recreating us and indeed making us to be more like him. The poor in spirit recognize this need for transformation, for being changed, to allow Christ to do what he will, what he wants in and through our lives. Then thirdly, being poor in spirit is admitting our need for humility about our spiritual condition. We saw that again illustrated from the parable we looked at at length last week and we mentioned briefly this morning. Our need for humility about our spiritual condition. Friends, there's no room for self-sufficiency, self-security, self-righteousness in the presence of Christ. Again, from that parable that Jesus told, the religious person, the religious leader, the Pharisee, made the mistake of comparing himself with other people. And sometimes we do the same thing. When really, the comparison is who we are with the Lord of life. And we will all be found wanting, not measuring up when we compare ourselves to Jesus. Indeed, we look at God's Bible and we discover that Jesus is our example when it comes to humility. I read from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor so that you, through his poverty, might become rich. Again, you've heard me say it many times, that Jesus gave up everything for us. He left all the glories of heaven, laying aside his power and prerogatives as the Lord of all things, becoming a peasant, becoming human like us, except without sin. He's the only one who led a perfect life. He gave up everything for us. So great is his love for each and every one of us. And if Christ as the Lord himself could humble himself and be found in the form of a servant and giving himself to the point of death, even death on a cross, what do you think that does for us as we look at our lives? It should shape us, change how we tend to look at ourselves. As persons greatly loved, but greatly in need of Christ Jesus himself. Now, as we look at the beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, we discover the fact that Jesus promises that the spiritually poor are now in God's kingdom. The spiritually poor are now in God's kingdom. That is the meaning of the word is in this beatitude. Friends, as we journey with Jesus, as we allow him to guide us and protect us and transform us and to be next to us and behind us and cover us in every area of life by his Holy Spirit, we are currently living in the very presence of the Lord himself. Yes, the fullness of God is with us and within us by his Spirit. Yes, Jesus has much more in store for us here as we live our lives moment by moment and day by day and off into all of eternity. Indeed, God's Bible describes the gift of the Holy Spirit who is with us and within us as the down payment of all that God has in store for us as we follow him. The down payment. There's more than living in the very presence of Christ Jesus. What is the kingdom of heaven? What is God's kingdom? It's the rule of God over our lives now. 
It's recognizing his authority over us. It's obeying him as he guides and directs us by the words in his Bible, by the truths that are there, and by his working by his spirit, and by our journeying together and helping one another. It's by the circumstances and situation of life where we recognize he is the ruler over all that we are, all that we hope to be, all that's going on in our lives. Because when we are spiritually poor, we are now in his kingdom right here, in this place, in your home, wherever you're watching today's message. We can experience God's care here and now as we live in willing surrender to Jesus. At some point, my friends, there will come a time when we will, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. We have the privilege, the opportunity to bow before him right here and right now. We don't need to wait to some point in the distance where all persons, when Jesus reveals himself, will be forced to kneel before him. We can live in willing surrender to God. We can obey him as he enables us to obey him, to follow him as he sheds the light of his presence across the path of our lives so we know who we can be and how we can live. And indeed, if we are poor in spirit, we will live in ways that show that Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus is in charge of our lives. The big things, the little things, the everythings of our lives. If we are poor in spirit, we will live in ways that show that Jesus Christ is Lord. He already is. We just need to agree that he is our Lord and open our lives to his continuing transforming power. So what might be the next step we take in our spiritual journeys? If you haven't already, I invite you to click on that link to the online con connection card. I remind you once again that as you submit that, I will be the only one who will see all the connection cards. And you can choose whether you want me to share your prayer requests and next steps with the prayer team. So this is secure. And again, I'm thanks, thankful for Jay to put so, many so much time in to get this put together. But here are some next steps that maybe the Lord wants you to take. Maybe we need to take a closer look at the truth about being poor in spirit. Maybe the next step we need to take is to accept our spiritual need and rely on God's forgiveness for the very first time. I want to take the next step and I ask that you'll pray with me and for me as I'm praying with you and for you. But I want to recall that Jesus Christ is Lord and live in obedience to him in every area of my life. Even though I've journeyed with Jesus for decades now, I still need to be reminded that he is Lord, I am not. And that he commands me to live in certain ways to show that I believe he is Lord. Maybe the step we need to take is to allow the Lord to save us from thinking that we're better than other people. Because we're not. We really aren't. Or maybe our next step is to tune in again next week as we look at the second beatitude from Matthew chapter 5, verse 4. And we talk about good grief. Good grief. Or there's a blank line there, and you're able to type something in on your connection card as well. If God's giving you a special step he wants you to take in your journey, I invite you to take that step. Please, once again, send in your connection card. Yeah. 
Thank you once again for tuning in and worshiping with us here at Open Arms. I remind you to go on there and please click the link for the connection card. And the digital card can, will be sent to me alone. And uh, so I can be praying with you and for you as we connect in this way. As we finish off today, I want to let you know. Don't want you to forget. Remember that Jesus loves you. Remember that Jesus likes you. Remember that Jesus wants you. And that Jesus wants to hang out with you. So let him do it. And let's live life this coming week in the very presence of God. Again, thanks and have a wonderful day. <laughs>